Have you ever seen an ambush predator that masquerades as a train in the subway to devour and digest unsuspecting travelers? What about a monster that uses a retail store as a front to consume its customers? A humanoid beast that decapitates your neighbor, puts their face up to your peephole, and uses it to speak through their voice to convince you to come outside? What about a parasite that invades an animal's body and deforms them into a monstrosity of nightmarish proportions? While this may sound like the paranoid delusional rantings of a man desperately trying to convert you to a new religion, they're actually stories based off of the artwork of Leo Vincible, an incredibly talented artist who blends found footage, cryptozoology, and the supernatural into an alternate dimension containing untold horrors. In this video, we'll be delving into that world and discussing these creatures. Without further ado, let's journey into the nightmarish alternate reality that is Leo Vincible's work. <laughs> Should we do something about that? Why do you care? Neither of us work here. I'm stealing from the register and you apparently have just been filling all the condoms up with spaghettios. Oh yeah. These images are the only known pieces of evidence of a novel anomalous creature. This entity has been dubbed the Last Customer by its discoverer Leo Vincible, who against all Foundation protests decided that this sensitive paranormal information belonged on his very notable Twitter account. Someone's gotta take the SCP Foundation behind the bar and face it towards the sun and shoot it in the back of the head. There's no quality of life anymore. The last customer has been documented in a few different locations, but without fail, this creature appears consistently in retail stores. While the exact pattern of its appearances is yet unknown, this creature usually appears in stores that feel especially liminal, like large nationwide retail brands or particularly highway gas stops. You know the ones, the ones where they always look exactly the same regardless of where you are, and you're always there high as balls at 3am and you don't even know how the fuck you got there, but you really hope you didn't drive yourself. This critter has appeared in several different scenarios in these stores, but it's most likely to appear at the end of the last shift, when the final customer is browsing the aisles, or the last employee is closing the doors for the night. All those who have had an experience with the last customer disappear soon afterwards. While there's no direct evidence connecting the cryptid to these disappearances, come on, idiot. I mean, that sounds kind of sus, but in my opinion, he's pretty cool. He didn't say shit when he saw me pocket that gum. It's not stealing if it's a big corporation or an old lady on the street. That's what I always say. To understand a bit more about this creature, we can examine its physical characteristics. The first very notable feature is its humanoid face. You got pretty close to looking like a person, but honestly I think you crossed over into Uncanny Valley Clown a few steps back. Other than that, this pineapple looking ass has a large amorphous blob of a body, with a variable amount of arms that all connect to it somewhere conveniently located off screen. No telling what the hell this thing's body actually looks like. It's almost as if it is intentionally designed that way. But we're going to ignore that. In some more detailed depictions of this monstrosity, we can see that the flesh around its face and extremities are raw and red, as if they've been somehow damaged, perhaps in an altercation. The creature is often tangled in between the shelves, spaghetti noodle ass arms in and out of every hole. It looks like it doesn't have any bones in its entire body, which could lead to our next theory about what this is. While the prevailing theory that I just made up is that this guy is just like any other big dumb animal and he just loves Doritos, others have a different theory. Some believe that this creature is connected to the stores that it lives in, living in between the pipes, vents, and shelves. I think that each of these creatures is a separate entity that at some point found a store to graft onto. This creature is a species that remains connected to this retail store its entire life, like a snail protected by its shell. See, the thing is, the store is a snail shell, but it's also a spider web. The chip dust and snack cakes lure obese clients to the last customer like flies to, well, flies like snack food too, so. In summation, I view you all as pests. This entity likely remains dormant in the vents and pipes of a store before finding a sole victim in a dark part of the store late at night, at which point it uncoils its horrible flesh pile from inside the vents to entirely consume its confused victims, or something goofy like that. To be entirely honest with you, I don't care what he is. He didn't say shit when I bought a bunch of zip ties, a pocket knife, a rag, some chemicals, and also a Snickers bar, which I appreciate because I'm self-conscious about my weight, but I still like to treat myself. Hey, dumbass. There's nothing left. Let's go. Yeah, one sec. I just gotta get done covering our tracks. I mean, entertaining the wonderful fans back home. I'm gonna take a sip of water. My mouth feels all craggly. 
The Neighbor is a pseudo-humanoid entity first reported upon by anomalous investigator Leo Vincible. Leo posted an image of this creature on the internet, displaying its strange form in detail. It has three arms, two where a human would normally have them, and one on top of its head. These three arms all rotate around the central point of its vacant slack-jaw mouth. This mouth is lined with large, human-like teeth, all dripping with snotty saliva. You know this man is both a mouth breather and doesn't brush. These teeth aren't sharp, but are rather used for mastication, similar to how a human eats. In the center of this mouth is a face, rendered immobile and held in place by the incredibly strong muscles in the creature's throat. The face inside the neighbor is not actually a part of its original biology. That face is of its last human victim. The victim only exists from the voice box up now, as the rest has been entirely digested. The neighbor has an anomalous evolutionary adaptation where it can manipulate the nervous system of the decapitated head through rudimentary electrical stimulation. The heads are technically still alive and conscious, but not in control of any of its actions. It's like I have no mouth and I must scream, but also really gross and nothing like that. All they can do is wait helplessly for the creature to find another victim and swallow their head to digest and then replace them. Through its manipulation methods, it can move the face and even speak through the mouth of the victim. It can do other things with that mouth too, but I can't show you that on YouTube. The voice sounds similar to that of the original humans, but because the methods of manipulation are simplistic, there are a lot of discrepancies. The neighbor will often use this ability to get humans out of their house. It knocks on the door of its intended prey and places the face of its former victim up to the peephole, obscuring the rest of its monstrous figure. You might think this wouldn't work. What? Hello! I, what do you want? Hello, I am your real human neighbor and not a man-eating creature keeping your neighbor's head alive as a flesh puppet in my gullet. May I come in for a cup of sandwich? Oh my God. Humans, even the smart ones, will believe almost anything you tell them. If you are dumb enough to open that door, you'll be in more trouble than I was when I replied to my teacher's end of class kahoot by saying I wanted to kashoot myself. Upon the human opening the door, the creature will seize one of the victim's arms in each of its torso arm's hands, and the head of the victim in its top hand. It will then swallow its current decapitated meat puppet and force the new victim legs first down into its gullet, securing its face in the back of its throat, and digesting the rest of its body. It then hooks itself into the nervous system of its new head. As is the life cycle of the neighbor, the only trail it leaves is an entirely intact, shitted out human skeleton. Nature is just so beautiful. I mean, not right now, this is an affront to life itself, but I don't know, go look at a spider web. The older one of these entities becomes, the more skilled it becomes at manipulating the human head speech patterns and facial expressions. Over a short period, it can jump in language skills, starting along the lines of a child with fetal alcohol syndrome and ending with something indistinguishable from the original human speech patterns. If not killed by a few years of age, it will progress at this neural manipulation from the proficiency level of a man and attempting to put on a sock puppet play using only his penis, to a skilled marionette performer pulling the strings of its victim to perfectly imitate its voice. One of these creatures got so advanced that it actually rose through the ranks of corporate America and is now an executive at Papa John's. Ugh. I don't know how many bones you have, but if you don't stop, that number's gonna double. Dude, Dude we, we just met. met. You, you know, know I only eat humans. This is about the no smoking code in the building. If you call the cops, I'll tell them you eat people. The shelf life of a decapitated human head is very limited. I learned that from Paula Dean. As the head rots inside of the entity's gullet, the brain will get less and less functional, and the neighbor's speech patterns will decay along with it. Eventually, the creature will get desperate and become more and more bold in its attempts to capture a human, which sometimes leads to its death by the fatal condition of getting f***ing shot. She awoke in the dark, feeling cold, and scratched a new sore spot on her side. It was wet. In her confusion, she grabbed her phone and shined its flashlight at her side, revealing an incredibly shallow bite mark and the elongated fingers of something that quickly recoiled into the dark and disappeared without a trace. This image was the only evidence posted of this novel uncategorized entity, uploaded by investigator Leo Vincible, alongside the phrase, don't let the bed bugs bite. This is the latest in many independent investigators telling the foundation exactly where they can stick their rules for distribution of anomalous media. Seriously, every time some bureaucracy tells me exactly how I have to walk through their red tape, I just want to strangle them with it. While an image and a phrase isn't a lot of information, it's still enough to get a baseline understanding of the creature in front of us. As always, on the AZFK Show, we 
we start by judging a book by its cover and examining the anomaly's physical characteristics. Its two giant red eyes alongside its scattered assemblage of smaller ones look primed for night vision, giant pigmented pupils to catch as much scarce light as possible. While at first glance, with this creature's stark white, unnaturally smooth skin and two little slit holes for a nose, it resembles a gray alien. However, this would be an oversimplification of the monster's true nature based on appearance alone. Let's take a closer look. It has a set of jet black gums around a perfectly maintained set of human teeth. Looks like this guy's been brushing. While this entity looks humanoid in shape from the shoulders up, based on the other anomalies that we've covered, it would be naive to assume that means it has a humanoid lower half. If it does, it looks like it might be straddling whoever it's on top of, suggesting that if we want to learn more about this creature, we should check the state's sex offender registry. All jokes aside, we can likely gauge a deeper understanding of this creature and how it operates by examining its namesake. The bedbug. The bedbug, as many know, is a blood-sucking parasite that makes its nest in fabrics of human homes. Most often in the bed, because that's where it gets the easiest access to the most blood. Yours! They crawl on you while you sleep. These creatures are most active during the spookiest hours of the night, midnight to 3 a.m. They can sense body heat and carbon dioxide using their antenna, and use these signals to locate their prey. Bedbugs can also live without feeding for three to six months, even up to 300 days in colder climates. They have flat torsos until they feed, at which point they blow up like balloons. Bedbugs also don't carry any diseases, which serves as an evolutionary advantage. Don't want to kill off your food source, or give them any more reason to get rid of you. I know what you're saying. Why are you spouting off about a random species of bug? What are you, some sort of bug fucker? That has nothing to do with the situation. That brings me to what my theory about the original creature really is. I believe that this is an anomalous parasitic creature that lives in the dwellings of humans, feeding off of them for sustenance. Leo Vincible likely wrote, don't let the bedbugs bite, as a fun wink to the audience. But it could also signify that this monstrosity shares traits with the everyday pest. Like a bedbug, it takes root in someone's home and begins to feed while they sleep at night. It's almost impossible to drive away, staying with the prey, consuming their blood, slowly making them weaker and weaker until they wither away. Or something goofy like that. When it only has a few people to feed off of, such as an individual or a family, it sucks them dry quickly and needs to relocate. When it lives in a larger group, it can sustain itself for longer. In complexes, dorms, departments, it can live unnoticed for years. In this one frat house, they put it through hazing. It's a member now. All the pledges have to get sucked off by it, and I guess that's better because they used to use a person for that. It isn't the goal of the bedbug to kill an individual, only to feed. But if it's hungry enough, it won't care for the fate of its food. This isn't malicious, it's just an animal, like any other. Like regular bedbugs, this creature can go long periods without feeding, and can reactivate from its inactive state upon detecting body heat or carbon dioxide from blood-having animals such as yourself. If it drank mine, I think it would just straight up die. Most creatures do. Game got really drunk, but that was a rare exception. The idea that this creature may be related to bedbugs make me guess again for what the red dots on the face might be. While I still think the two large ones, as well as some of the others, are solely sight organs, I believe that some of the red sense organs may be responsible for sensing things like carbon dioxide and body heat. This creature could use these like bedbugs, but take it one step further, and attempts to locate the largest populations of humans for the most assured supply of meals. I wonder if we put this guy in a crack house, would he get really high and then addicted? If we put him in a brothel, would he get an STD? What about if we put him in Wisconsin, would he get diabetes? I ask the questions that really matter. Now let's say this critter is really close to bedbugs in nature. Like really close. Fun fact, bedbugs mate through a method known as traumatic insemination. Translation, the guy bedbug has a really sharp penis and stabs the ass of the girl bedbug and then nuts into her bloodstream. That wasn't very fun, but it was a fact. Nature is just so beautiful sometimes. I mean, not this. This makes me want to turn the entire earth into a fucking parking lot, but I don't know, go drink some ocean or something. The photo in question was likely taken when this bedbug had completely filled itself. Like a regular bedbug, it has a lower half that's just kind of like an empty balloon when it hasn't fed, and then it fills this stupid sack until it's bursting at the seams with other people's blood. Then it drags its fat ass away on its two front limbs. It may have been too overzealous in feeding in a large apartment complex, and got too obese to waddle away before someone pulled out their iPhone, or some shit like that. See, I told you, a real mega horn. But what does it mean? It means you're too high and need to go to bed. Or give me some of whatever it is. Megahorn, the destroyer of the siren heads. 
a nickname he insists that he did not give to himself. As the name implies, Megahorn is the primary and only predator of the Siren Head species. It is not only the consumer of Siren Heads, but in fact, related to them as well. Ew. The Megahorn evolved from a lineage of Siren Head that consumed larger fauna than humans, such as cows or other cattle. And we're also not opposed to cannibalism. Over time, this sect of Siren Heads diversified enough that they were considered a separate species from the original. Larger, hungrier, and more aggressive, they began to stop consuming their own in favor of hunting their smaller, weaker cousins. They took a new form as their physiology changed with evolution. The Megahorn has a massive singular horn in the dead center of its head. It has a body similar to that of a typical siren head, but instead of the iconic shriveled horror physique, it has a flap-like beer gut used to store the consumed bodies of its former ancestors. It also has an additional pair of arms to help it both walk and accost its prey. This, along with its tubby torso, gives the Megahorn an arachnid-like appearance. Some of you may be confused about the nature of siren heads and megahorns, but allow me to dispel any misinformation spread by the siren head news networks. Siren heads are actually an evolutionary tree of life, not one sole immortal supernatural entity. In fact, there are many different species of siren head. There are lamppost heads, traffic light heads, even vibrator heads, which, for some inexplicable reason, are the most popular variety. They populate the entire planet, as humans do, but in significantly fewer numbers. They are a cognitohazardous species, meaning that the trademark sirens and signals that the siren heads broadcast can manipulate the cognition and overall psyche of humans that hear it. While it is quite scary of a concept, some humans can become immune to cognitohazards through controlled exposure. Like that guy who tried to vaccinate himself against snake bites using snake venom and then survived, I'm pretty sure. I don't know, I didn't finish the YouTube video. Like all species, they are limited by their food source, which for siren heads is you, and for megahorns is siren heads, and you. Hence why the megahorn is encountered in far fewer numbers than the siren head. While some state that the act of a siren head consuming another siren head causes the megahorn mutation to occur like some skinwalker shit, this isn't actually the case. The megahorn is simply a much rarer creature that's encountered less often. They just look like siren heads because they evolved from them and humans love to make shit up. But don't take that away from them. They have such fun lying to each other. For example, some religious organizations said that the Megahorn is a god protecting them from Siren Head. The reality is, the Megahorn couldn't give less of a shit about him. He's just hungry. He'll eat him as a snack if he doesn't have to get up from the couch to reach them. Such idiots running up to worship Megahorns and getting gulped have been documented by many horrified bystanders and one furiously masturbating borophile. The impact of the Megahorn's existence primarily means that there are fewer siren heads, which is a net positive for humanity. Because of this, the Foundation has ranked them low priority. Although, this guy is definitely not friendly to humans. The Megahorn's range of its siren is vast compared to that of a siren head, and the power of its blasts outweigh its shrimpy little cousin too. It can pop a human head like a testicle that's been shot by a BB gun. This powerful sound is actually meant for disabling other siren heads, but because the power needed for that is immense, it causes extreme damage to both property and anything living. Unlike the siren head, Megahorn has no biological limit in its growth, meaning that like some reptiles like alligators, snapping turtles, and komodo dragons, they can get as big as their food abundance allows. No, 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 I mean it is a good thing. Like people think you're buff and stuff. No one is calling you fat. It consumes all. Those who seek it leave with nothing. It is desire. It is greed. The manifestation of a constant need to consume in physical form. This was the last recorded communication from a man who made a deal with an entity named the Black Crown. His corpse was found barricaded inside of his home, all of his valuables missing. He had taken the coward's way out. The Black Crown was first documented by Leo Vincible, and then subsequently documented by Clark Tidor, two paranormal investigators who decided the best way to respond to the Foundation's sanctions on anomalous evidence was a nice hard flick direct to the center of the scrotum. Classic. This entity not only embodies greed, it's the actual concept of greed. The creature has an obsidian-toned skeletal form and stands slightly above seven feet in height. Its emaciated stature signifies an unending hunger. The entity's skull ends in three points that resemble a crown. Under this is an unmoving, unnerving grim that would go from ear to ear if he had ears. It has no visible sense organs save for a jaw full of perfectly white, manicured teeth. 
While it can still seemingly sense the world unhindered by this, he did say that he felt left out when all his old Wall Street buddies started snorting coke. The Black Crown reportedly speaks every human language at once, and whoever encountered it reports that they heard it speaking the language they were most familiar with, but with a touch of an unplaceable accent. The creature has an insatiable appetite for things deemed valuable. Gemstones, gold, priceless artwork, exotic cars, champagne, expensive escorts, you know, the high life. It'll do anything in its power to obtain something it desires. Anything short of giving something up. This often spells the death of the original owner of the item in question. He will ask once politely, and if the person refuses, he'll take it anyway. If the person tries to stop him, he will proceed to beat them the fuck to death. From his interview with Clark Tidor, he wrote, it's that person's fault for not complying with a reasonable request. Well, when he explains it like that, I kinda get it. Yo, free my boy, he didn't do nothing. In the past, he wore gold to shine above the rest, but he has updated his fashion with the times for the thousands of years that he's been alive. During the Renaissance, he wore the most expensive garments dyed with the rarest pigments. For most of the 20th century, he wore only the finest of suits and jewelry. Since his idea of what is good is based so much on greed and value, his brain recently kinda got tricked by the supreme types, and he now has since switched to a more neurodivergent 12-year-old hype beast aesthetic. His greed is not restricted to material things. On some occasions, the Black Crown will recognize something special in an individual with greed in their heart. Something money cannot buy. Unique skills, emotions, memories, experiences, anything that he deems valuable. Thank God I don't have any of those things. He will offer the individual a deal, and offer more in response to them refusing, until they basically can't. Granting them the life they want, luxuries, powers, health for the rest of their natural life, in exchange for what he wants. Sometimes this ends in ironic circumstances. For example, the Black Crown granted an artist the professional life and respect that he wanted. However, what the Black Crown wanted was his artistic ability. And as the artist slowly began to lose that, he lost his career as well. Way to read the fine print, dumbass. While the Black Crown is preternaturally physically capable, he is not immortal. Enough firepower will turn the fucker to dust. Literally, when he sustains enough damage, he dissolves into dust like Tom Holland's Spider-Man. I don't want to die, Mr. Stark. Thing is, you can't really kill the concept of greed. The dust is swept away by the wind, but the spirit still lingers, and it immediately begins its search for a human with a heart completely corrupted by greed. Whether it's a narcissistic influencer or that guy from BP who busted all over the ocean or some shit, eventually a perfect target is found. The spirit latches onto the individual and influences it to lean full tilt into its greed. Over time, the greed completely overtakes every aspect of their personality. Eventually, the bones in the individual's head and body elongate and change. Their skin hardens into a dark exoskeleton, and they lose all sensory organs, except that with which they can consume. Or something goofy like that. Not only does the Black Crown have a significant stake in every world economy, he also sells courses that falsely claim he can get you to his economic status. Get rich! Immediately. No effort or action required. For nine easy payments of $29.95, I'll send you 14 unlisted YouTube videos with the concept of visualization. Results not guaranteed nor likely. Entering your credit card may cause all of your money to be wired directly to a shell corporation in Mumbai. Some of those traits might sound similar to another entity that's commonly discussed on the internet. That's because I based that part off Andrew Tate. But don't worry, the Black Crown is not a sex trafficker. Sometimes people will edit wiki pages with shit that I make up, and I really hope this is gonna be one of those times. By the way, none of this is canon, I made it all up. An anomalous apex predator has recently been reported stalking remote towns in southern Africa. A stark bone white faceplate, jagged razor edge teeth, a virus shaped body with four legs the front ending in finger-like extensions, and the back ending in cloven hooves. In the center of the torso, an open gash containing a writhing pile of human heads. A cacophony of pained, desperate moans escape the pulsing maw. He told me that I was still alive with Cletus, and I believed him. This creature was first documented by preternatural investigator Leo Vincible, who instead of submitting it to the Foundation for approval, decided to submit it to Twitter for likes without a single sh** given for what the Foundation labels due process. What can I say? He's built different. He didn't really give it a name, so I will be dubbing this beastie the Cacophony. The first thing about this creature that instantly grabs the eye is the collection of heads inside of its split chest cavity. These heads inside are not its own. This predator targets humans and steals heads from its victims, inserting them 
into the center of its chest cavity. It integrates these heads into its own neurology, keeping them alive and preserving the consciousness inside the brain, trapping the human with barely enough processing power in their brain to know their own suffering. This allows it to access the head's memories, and it can even use it as a meaty biological processor. The more heads the cacophony has, the more cunning it becomes, using more and more advanced hunting techniques, and even constructing complex tools like traps to catch its victims. Keep in mind, if it has like four McDonald's employees, it still might function on a capacity lower than if it has two CEOs and nowhere near as skilled as if it had one YouTuber. The classic cacophony quality quantity quandary. The cacophony's top head often screams a range of vocalizations at the victim it's attempting to decapitate. While it's fully capable of communicating with humans, it most often doesn't even bother to. The vocalizations include voices and sayings from former victims in their lives. These will often come off as nonsensical shrieks, as the things the creature is saying don't really make sense to say when attacking someone. She never loved me because my mother, my, mo my mother, she loved my brother Tommy. She didn't even say, uh, you're you, my little schmeckle. I, kn I know I'm a schmeckle. Another notable feature of this entity is its white mask. No one knows what its face looks like beyond the mask. Some say it has low self-esteem and doesn't like its face. Some people say it just thinks the mask looks cool. I say, if you're wondering about a mask as this thing approaches you to rip off your head and put it in titty purgatory, you have dumb priorities. You deserve to die, idiot. I think it's you. I think you're the problem. Just beneath the mask lies an agape mouth with a set of razor sharp teeth. This jaw is used to hold the victim in place while removing the head with its two front limbs, and then it takes bites out of the resulting corpse for sustenance. The creature's back two legs are hooves, and the front two are a cross between human hands and gorilla feet. Unlike traditional quadruped movement, this creature has a bodily structure that has a center of gravity in the direct center of all four of its legs. Like a tripod, but with four legs. So, like a quad pod, it can make incredibly quick turns and dexterous maneuvers. Side note, I've been saying quadruped a lot, and it reminded me of the time I had to message a biology professor about gorillas, and I made a misspelling. Instead of saying, when the gorilla knuckle walks, it's a quadruped, I messaged that it was quadruped because quadruped is one letter off from quadrant. Dumbest disciplinary hearing ever. What the hell am I talking about again? The combination of hoofed legs and the quad pod structure makes it so that in close quarters, the cacophony is deadly. At the end of the day, if you're happy and you love yourself, do good. Do good, children. Hey dude, I'm, I'm kind of like doing something right now. <laughs> The cacophony's flap can open and close. The primary function of this is thought to be ambush predation. It disguises itself as a smelly pile of dead animals by laying flat on its side with its flap closed. After something approaches it, it will proceed to kill and eat the animal. It hunts anything that moves, but only gathers the heads of humans. All this means that it's too dangerous to be in the environment, which is why I sent it to be safe and happy and frolic at a farm upstate. Hello? Hello? It's dark in here! Guys, everybody, AZFK, he, he, he locks me in the locker, he locks me in there, and he makes me do drugs. You just like f that man's whole world up, bro. Like, he thought the darkness was forever, and then you gave him light again and put him right back in. <laughs> Wait, it, who's in the cage? A novel anomalous force has been affecting wildlife worldwide. While the specifics of the effects on these animals are borderline unpredictable, there are some recurring symptoms. The morphology of the animal twists and distorts into a nightmarish, seemingly random visage. The creature can lose or sprout additional limbs, sense organs, teeth, anything. Not only that, but it appears some pieces of their morphology can split open, revealing new structures like a giant maw. The process takes place slowly over time, and is evidently incredibly painful for the animal in question, as they shriek a constant dull moan that does nothing to drown out the horrific snapping and creaking of their bones like old hardwood floors as they reshape in nonsensical ways. So far, the phenomena has been documented affecting giraffes, birds, deer, bear, sheep, rhino, dog, and various sea animals. Not only does the morphology of the animal change, but the behavior as well. The condition changes every animal it affects into a reckless and aggressive carnivore. These photographs of the anomalous wildlife event were taken by investigator Leo Vincible, who decided that the anomalous containment foundation's rules and regulations work better as fireplace material than reading material. 
Giving the finger to the paranormal government is a dirty job, but someone's gotta do it. While the cause of this plague upon the fauna of Earth is yet unknown, we can still theorize on what the possible cause might be. I initially believed that this might be the work of somebody supernaturally talented, representing humanity's sins against the natural world by using animals as a living canvas. Maybe as some sort of protest piece against environmental damage. I know what you're thinking. Doesn't disfiguring animals as a symbolic statement for ecosystem destruction go against the very reason they'd been doing it? Yeah, but like, have you ever talked to a human? They're walking contradictions. Half of them tweet about how bad child labor is from their smartphones the second they get them hot off the child labor factory line. Sure, we could guess it's some sort of curse, or a metaphysical manipulation from a supernatural source, or perhaps some energy leaking in from another dimension, but there's little to no evidence for those ideas. Aside from just suspension of disbelief, so I guess it's back to the drawing board. While information about this phenomena on the internet is scarce to say the least, there is a popular theory floating around about what's making these animals into literal fucking monsters. The theory is that this is caused by a virus making rapid zoonetic shifts between species. This virus causes genetic sequence disturbances in the form of virus-induced gene mutations. These virus-induced mutations are not fully understood by human scientists, and are probably due to the insertions of fragments of viral DNA into the host chromosomes. Essentially, the virus corrupts the DNA of the animal, and for some reason that we don't fully understand yet, the animal's body begins to act as some sort of horrific physiology randomizer, morphing the poor creature's form to look like some sort of Cronenberg Mr. Potato Head for limbs and sense organs. Question is, if it is a virus, what happens when the virus makes the shift to mankind? While the virus theory is all well and good, if you're a fan of my show for some reason, first off get therapy, and second, you may have noticed a parallel between these dumb broken animals and some other dumb broken animals documented by a different investigator. Anomalous investigator Trevor Henderson has posted numerous examples of different creatures with their morphology severely affected by a parasitic worm. This worm wiggles its way inside of an animal and then hollows them out using them as a puppet to hunt other prey and reproduce. This parasite would make sense is the cause for this new unnatural habitat phenomena, as it severely affects both the morphology and the behavior of its host. Although its favorite target is bird, it's gone after larger animals like deer and even people. I believe that Leo's documentation of these unnatural animals may be further examples of different forms of this lamprey parasite. I know what you're saying. You don't make no gosh darn sense, eyeball man. That doesn't explain the growth and limbs and the entire body rearrangement of many of these types of animals. Well, you stupid fuck, that's where the virus theory comes back into play. If this lamprey were to carry pathogens of its own, it's possible that these pathogens could also make the same zoonetic shift just as rapidly, if not more rapidly than the worms. It looks as though the invasive species of lamprey hasn't been wearing its condoms, and if it tries to worm its way inside of humans again, that virus sounds like your problem too. See, we can both win. Both theories can be right, except they're not. They're both wrong because none of this was canon and I made it all up, except for the parts that I stole. <laughs> train Eater. The Train Eater was first reported upon by anomalous investigator Leo Vincible in the New York subway. Leo somehow managed to snap a picture of this creature in its non-camouflage state, an incredibly rare sight. In its resting state, the train eater resembles a long flesh-colored worm with the length of its body dotted with eyes. Like many creatures, if you poke it in the eye, it screams. In the front, this creature has a large mouth lined with razor-sharp teeth. Its mouth is usually agape with a muscular structure in the front that looks like a trapped humanoid being. Scientists are unsure of what purpose this serves, but one theory is that it is a vestigial organ that ancestors of the train eater used to lure humans into its massive maw, which is why many of these lures have humongous tits. When in the presence of human beings, this entity is usually unrecognizable. It modifies parts of its body, bio-shifting to perfectly mimic man-made vehicles such as trains, buses, hot tub stripper limos, etc. This appears to be an incredibly advanced anomalous form of camouflage, like a stick bug in a tree, or a leaf bug in a tree or you at a clown convention. Indistinguishable. The train often shows up at vorophile conventions or busy subways during rush hour in order to have the largest potential meal. This entity gathers as many victims inside of itself as possible and then shifts its physiology to trap its victims inside, removing the doors they enter from. It will then speed off to an abandoned section of the tracks before filling its gut with corrosive digestive juices, digesting the entirety of the contents of its stomach. After this, it promptly enters a hibernation state before waking up a few weeks later with a renewed 
food appetite. It operates like a regular train until full to the brim with passengers. So some people actually ride the train eater home from work being none the wiser that they were almost worm food. The train eater acts in a similar capacity to natural ambush predators. This is becoming a trope. We've covered a whole lot of anomalous ambush predators recently. Come on guys, get a new shtick. Paranormal researcher Clark Tidor has theorized that the train eater is actually an incredibly large insect capable of modifying itself in its physiology. But upon further investigation, this creature shares more in common with worms, and also somehow a lot with legless lizards. While some theorize that this is some sort of genetic amalgamation with DNA from the two, some always theorize that, so who the hell knows, really? Some speculate that the train eater could be used as a fleshlight for a giant and that someone is me. The train eater is also capable of sprouting legs across its entire body, coming to resemble a monstrous fleshy centipede. It uses these legs to burrow under the ground, creating a nest to lay clutches of eggs. It also uses these legs to traverse between subways and the streets to avoid suspicion from human authorities. The FBI even occasionally catches really disturbed train eaters that masquerade as school buses. Fortunately, these train eaters are always the first to get murdered in train eater jail by the other criminal train eaters. Maybe karma is real. Human researchers are astounded at the level of intelligence that train eaters display. I don't know why your species is always so shocked when another animal is smart. Oh sure, fill your oceans to the brim with plastic bottles and be surprised when the collected microplastic amounts to you eating one credit card a week, but they're the idiots. While train eaters typically remain in one area and nest, there have been cases of nomadic train eaters. One of these entities masqueraded as a greyhound bus, traveling around the entire country multiple times. This particular train eater was much larger than the average for its species, and contrary to their typical behavior, on occasion displayed aggression and active hunting rather than its typical sneaky behavior. Before its termination that many anomalous enforcement agencies claimed credit for, it left a trail of chaos in its wake. It imitated a travel van for a band before massacring and consuming the entire concert, transformed into a yacht before eating an entire cartel, it even had a travel vlog. The Primary Color Man The Primary Color Man is a humanoid entity with a complexion of various patches split between the three primary colors. Preternatural investigator Leo Vincible has documented this creature numerous times in both picture and video format. The origin of this entity is still a mystery, although many horror YouTubers list finding him in the back rooms at 3am. This creature only attacks the colorblind and idiots who don't know the three names of the primary colors. At least that's the only pattern I can gauge thus far from this inhuman monstrosity with a kindergarten level of education. Before anyone goes and calls this creature ableist, it, it knows. It's an inhuman monster that enjoys murdering people. I agree with you, I'm just saying, it's a weird hill to die on. The primary color man is able to manipulate various facets of sensory perception. For for example, it's able to distort a human's visual processing center in the brain. It can make it impossible for them to focus their eyes, remove their perception of color, or increase their saturation and contrast until they're living in a deep-fried version of their own reality. <laughs> It can also give its victims incredibly intense synesthesia. This synesthesia is reported as tasting, smelling, and hearing the colors in such an overwhelming sense that it leads to total sensory overload and sometimes insanity. Some even report feeling the colors as temperature or pain. One of the primary color man's victims began writhing in pain and begging for death when shown the color red, profusely vomiting when shown the color green, and was banned from school zones and had to go door to door whenever he moved following his actions after being shown the color pink. Did you learn your colors? Dude. Step back, your breath smells like you hit a bong filled with pee. The primary color man is also capable of shifting his skin's pigmentation in order to camouflage against any surface like a chameleon. It uses this ability to stay hidden and stalk its victims, sometimes for years. It enjoys altering the human senses at a rate so gradual that they don't even know they're being changed. Slowly but surely, the human adjusts to what they think was always their reality. The primary color man camouflaged right behind them, snickering to himself silently as it relishes their anguish. Eventually, this will leave them completely dissociated with reality and will begin to act erratically and develop ludicrous beliefs. This entity is also capable of shifting its skin pigmentation to recreate any pattern consciously, not just one that it's in front of. It often disguises itself as a bloody defiled corpse with streaks of red and tan and lies in wait for a passerby to see them. When the victim gets close enough, the entity will grab the sides of their head, holding it in place and lock eyes with them. It will then completely distort their senses so severely that it leaves them unable to process any sensory information from the world without descending into the 
complete insanity. Anomalous Foundations have recently seized all evidence relating to a police case believed to be connected to several brutal homicides. The reason behind it remained mysterious until recently. Leo Vincible released this image depicting an entity alongside the caption, Ragboy. While these might seem unrelated at first, it's the nature of the murders and the caption of the evidence that prove their connection. The bodies of the deceased were all found displayed in unique, strange, and horrific art house manners. However, there are some consistencies in each case. Sewing needles and thread used to manipulate the poses of the body and mutilate the body parts. The eyes, mouth, nostrils, ears, even both front and back knotty holes were found either sewn open or closed. The body is either suspended in the air or sewn into furniture, onto walls, to the ceiling, everything in the kitchen sink. And I don't just mean the saying, he sewed one guy to a kitchen sink. Wherever they're found, the victim's body and limbs are posed in lifelike stances all held in place by sewing thread. The police and media alike were stunned at the intricacy of the scenes, and noted that almost superhuman care and skill must have gone into this almost artistic horror show. The media was following the alleged serial killings, and the local presses had given the perpetrator a name, Ragboy. I don't know why they named the serial killer that, but at least they didn't give him a cool serial killer name, like the Iceman or the Salami Strangler. I feel like if we want people to stop serial killing, we have to give them embarrassing names in the media. Like wet the bed until he was 17, the Ripper. Statistically true, by the way, serial killers pee the bed for way too long, look it up. As the cases piled up and got more attention, the Foundation took notice and monitored the town where this was occurring closely. Eventually, they found their man, Rag boy, critter, thing. A security camera captured the entity murdering and then carefully setting up his victim in the final frame of a Fortnite dance. With this information, the Foundation moved to observe the entity in its natural habitat before moving to containment. It's totally not that they couldn't get their supernatural DMV asses in gear to put this pointy dish rag in a box. That's for sure. Leo may have gotten this image from the same security leak, and it brings vital information in understanding this creature's physiology. At first glance, he may appear to be a being made entirely out of cloth and thread. Patchwork burlap skin held together by frayed gray threads, two bright orange button eyes stitched in with a crisscross pattern, and fingers webbed together by string dangling a litany of sharp needles. Upon further examination, it's clear that he has a set of human teeth and gums, meaning that he's at least partially biological in nature. It's possible that the burlap and thread is only skin deep, leaving a possibility that what's under it was human. From the Foundation's observation, it became clear that this entity was violent, but perhaps not inherently malicious. While Ragboy is murdering individuals in horrific manners and using needles and string to pose them like action figures on a chubby kid's desk, evidently, he's only doing it to people who have done some fucked up things. The majority of his victims have abusive tendencies, violent felonies, or like, at least littered or something. We can only hope that Ragboy's idea of good and bad line up with your own. Everyone thinks they're the good guy, especially the bad guy. I'm I'm fairly sure that Kim Jong-un thinks he's, like, the best guy. So, just saying. Sometimes, the body display is clearly a message specifically for the individual victim. For example, Ragboy once visited a politician who lied to an entire town about the safety of a mining structure, only to have the structure collapse, killing over a hundred men, famously and gruesomely decapitating one on camera. This politician was found hanging upside down by the legs from the rubble of the very same structure. His head sloppily sawed off at the neck, but suspended from the stub by several threads. His mouth sewn shut, his eyes sewn open, peering directly down at his crimes. Another of Ragboy's victims was this creep who would grope people on the subway. He was found with his hands sewn around his dick and balls in a masturbatory pose, bringing a whole new meaning to the phrase, go fuck yourself. This one time, and I have no idea what the guy did, but he sewed a deaf guy's ears shut. And then he got taken off Twitter. Elon put him back on though, and then everyone kind of forgot about it when we all rightfully told Mr. Beast how terrible he was for making that child no longer blind. Oh wait, shit, I think Ragboy also sewed that kid's eyes shut. You know, maybe the foundation is wrong. I think he might just be doing this at random. By the way, none of this was canon. I made it all up. If you like this video for some reason and want me to come back and talk about more weird nonsensical critters, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe with all notifications enabled and watch all my other stuff or I'll feed you to the last customer. Shout out the inner circle. Love y'all. <laughs>